Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the province of the most pure heart of Mary and the School of Theology and Religious Studies at Catholic University, it is my privilege as director of the Center for Carmelite Studies to welcome you from near and far to this inaugural lecture of the Endowed Chair for Carmelite Studies. Mindful that we are celebrating the Feast of St. John of the Cross today, let us begin this evening with prayer as we listen to five stanzas of The Dark Night in Spanish and in English. Let's start our prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. En una noche oscura, con ansias, en amores inflamada, oh dichosa aventura, san salí sin ser notada, estando ya mi casa sosegada. A oscuras y segura, por la secreta escala disfrazada, oh dichosa aventura, a oscuras y encelada, estando ya mi casa sosegada. En la noche dichosa, en secreto, que nadie me veía, ni yo miraba cosa, sin otra luz y guía, sino la que en el corazón ardía. A que ésta me guiaba, más cierto que la luz del mediodía, a donde me esperaba, quien yo bien me sabía, en parte donde nadie parecía. Oh noche que guiaste, oh noche amable más que la alborada, o noche que juntaste, amado con amada, amada en el amado transformada. One dark night filled with love's urgent longings, ah, sheer grace. I went out unseen, my house now being all stilled. In darkness and secure, by the secret ladder disguised, ah, sheer grace in darkness and concealment my house being now all stilled on that glad night in secret for no one saw me nor did i look at anything with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart this guided me more surely than the light of the moon to where he was awaiting me him i knew so well there in a place where no one appeared O guiding night O oh, night more lovely than the dawn, O oh, night that has united the lover with his beloved, transforming the beloved in her lover. Amen. My name is Brother Daryl Moresco. I'm the director of the Center for Carmelite Studies. And it is my privilege to welcome the Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies, Father Mark Morozovich, to the podium to introduce Father Stephen Payne, the endowed professor of the Chair of Carmelite Studies. Thank you, Brother Darrell. On behalf of the School of Theology and Religious Studies and my dear brothers in the Carmelite Order, we welcome you today and we have the honor of hearing the inaugural lecture of the Carmelite Province of the Most Pure Heart of Mary endowed professor, Father Stephen Payne. He himself is a priest of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Washington Province of Discalced Carmelite Friars. He entered the Discalce Carmelite Order in 1972 and was ordained to the priesthood in 1982. He holds multiple academic degrees, including a PhD in philosophy from Cornell University and a PhD in theology from the Catholic University of America. He comes to us from his most recent position as the president of the Carmelite Institute here in Washington, D.C. He has taught at the Weston School of Theology in Boston, at the DeSales School of Theology 
the Washington Theological Union in Washington, D.C. He also has a distinguished tenure as president of Tangaza University College, a constituent college of the Catholic University of Eastern Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. He maintains his Kenyan ties by serving as the current editor of the Tangaza Journal of Theology and Mission. His areas of specialization include Carmelite studies, spirituality and mysticism, philosophy of religion, and systematic theology. He is a well-respected and prolific scholar, having written and edited several scholarly texts and over a dozen articles, book chapters, encyclopedia and reference entries, as well as book reviews. He is a sought-after lecturer on the Carmelite Order, speaking in the United States, Africa, Spain, Australia, and Rome. Most notably, his work speaks to his commitment to the Carmelite family and the respect of his peers. In addition to serving as the editor of several Carmelite publications, he is a member of the Institute of Carmelite Studies in Washington, D.C., and the Carmelite Forum, and a former member of the Scouse Carmelite International Theological Commission. He has served as provincial counselor and provincial director of formation and education for the Washington province, superior of the Descalced Carmelite Monastery here in Washington, D.C., director of Simply Professed in the Descalced Carmelite Community in Nairobi, Kenya, organizer and first chairman of the Carmelite family in Kenya and president of the Carmelite Institute in Washington, D.C. Today, Without further ado, we look forward to his inaugural lecture, the first ever of the Chair of Carmelite Studies. His talk entitled, The Dark Night of the Soul, Yesterday and Today, Revisiting John of the Cross's Classic Text and Symbol. Please join me in welcoming Father Stephen Payne. Sorry, something has happened to the first page. No. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And let me take this off too. Uh, as you can see, we're uh, doing this under unusual circumstances and I haven't had a lot of experience doing uh, Zoomed uh, lectures like this. I've done a few classes, but uh, I hope that it will work. I see we already have 300 people uh, trying to uh, participate, and maybe there are more who were locked out, but we're going to be recording this so that people can watch it later. So allow me to begin. Um, and I, I welcome, uh, I mean, President Garvey, Provost Dominguez, the vice presidents, if any of them are, are watching at the moment, the deans of the schools, especially Father Mark Morosevich, my own dean, other members of the Catholic University administration, faculty, staff, and students, members of the extended Carmelite family, especially the friars of the province of the most pure heart of Mary, our sponsor, all other Carmelite nuns, friars, lay and secular Carmelites, and so on, who have tuned in, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to you all and thank you for, for participating. Um, I said in November 2019, you can go to the next slide, and the next. At the launch of the new Center for Carmelite Studies here at the Catholic University that I feel both honored and daunted by the task entrusted to me as the first chair. Since that time, our Dean, Father Mark Morosevich, has kept reminding me that one of the chief expectations of a new chair is to present an inaugural lecture. The long delay was due to many factors, including my own hesitations. Uh, I'm told that an inaugural lecture is meant to provide an opportunity for newly appointed professors and shareholders to showcase their academic achievements, to celebrate with family and friends, 
and to share their plans for future research. However, not so long ago, I had to deliver just such a lecture at Tangazi University College in Nairobi, recounting my rather odd intellectual and academic journey to date. And that text has already been published. And more recently, I've spoken twice here uh, at Catholic University on Carmelite studies and what we expect the center to offer to this institution and the broader church and society. And the videos of those remarks are also available online. And having just turned 70, I think it would be a little presumptuous of me to commit to some massive research project for the next 20 years. So I really wasn't sure what more I could add that would fit. Next slide. Then came the COVID-19 pandemic, which upended everyone's planning anyway, along with the accompanying economic fallout, the renewed reckoning with issues of systemic racism, the ongoing controversies around this year's elections. Uh, yet in the midst of so much turmoil and uncertainty, one detail I found particularly striking. Over and over again, people of all religious and political persuasions have been describing what's been happening both individually and collectively as a kind of dark night of the soul. Regarding the pandemic, for example, the proto-secretary general of the Synod of Bishops, Mario Gresh, blunt bluntly declared, quote, we're going through the dark night of the soul. The meaning we have given to a lot of things is vanishing, end of quote. Uh, and Thea Butler, who's an associate professor of religion and Africana studies at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, agrees with this. She says, quote, it's a dark night of the soul, the ripping away of the familiar, the comforting, and the, and the soothing. Uh, retreat houses and spirituality centers, ironically, have had to cancel or postpone events on the theme of the dark night because of the pandemic. Uh, David Manor of the Kansas-Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptists has warned against overly upbeat online religious services during the health crisis in an essay entitled fake worship in the dark night of the soul. The Chilean American novelist and playwright Ariel Dorfman argues that the coronavirus is teaching Americans what it's like to live in exile. And he adds, quote, when you resurface, do not forget to look back on the dark night of the soul and body that you have gone through. With regard to politics on the Newsmax site, which is uh, one of Donald Trump's favorite alternatives now to Fox News. James Herson writes that Trump supporters are currently undergoing a dark night of the soul. While elsewhere, Trump's critics openly wonder whether the election of Biden means that, quote, we are emerging from the dark night of our nation's soul, end of quote. And still others have been talking about the societal dark night around issues of racial justice and calling for an end to the, quote, long dark night of racism. Various commentators, psychologists, counselors, and freelance spiritual teachers have been speaking or writing about, quote, our collective dark night, or, quote, the dark night of the soul of humanity uh, during these times. And there are plenty more examples. Of course, not everyone is aware of the roots of this expression in the Carmelite tradition, and specifically in the works of the first Carmelite doctor of the church, St. John of the Cross, and the treatise he wrote, which bears this title, John himself would likely be surprised that this terminology has become so widespread and is now being used in such diverse ways. But all of this reminded me that it was John's teaching on the dark night which first drew me to him over 50 years ago and continues to do so. As a Catholic undergraduate at, the, at Cornell University, a proudly non-denominational institution, I was struggling with questions of faith and meaning. I had begun in my free time voraciously reading whatever classic mystical authors I could find, as well as more recent studies of mysticism and religious experience. Since I had no real guidance or method, my reading list was a bit of a hodgepodge, as you can see, not just Catherine of Siena, Julian of Norwich, and the Cloud of Unknowing, but also Plotinus, Meister Eckhart, William Blake, Evelyn Underhill, Thomas Merton, The Way of the Pilgrim, the Bhagavad Gita, the Tao Te Ching, The Three Pillars of Zen, Carlos Castaneda, Sufi stories, uh, you name it. Writings in transpersonal psychology. How much I really understood of all this at the ripe old age of 20 is hard to say, 
but it was the late 1960s and early 1970s, which was an era of enormous social and cultural change, and we were all searching for some kind of spiritual enlightenment beyond what the mainstream churches seemed to be offering. What impressed me about John of the Cross was that he was the first Christian author I had encountered who explored in such depth and detail the potential grace in the turmoil that I and others were experiencing. Of course, even then I knew that he was not the inventor of apophatic mysticism or the via negativa. The theme of divine darkness and hiddenness and the implications of the incommensurability of God and creatures can be traced back beyond Gregory of Nyssa and Pseudo Dionysius and so many others to the scriptures themselves. But at that moment, John helped me understand in a deeper way that because God infinitely surpasses any limited human statements or feelings or images or conceptions, however precious they may be to us, we must be able to let them go at the appropriate time insofar as they impede God's deeper self-communication. In other words, John reassured me that loss, disillusionment, and confusion are not necessarily something to fear or avoid, but a necessary step on the path of human and spiritual growth. And one could see that this principle could be extended with appropriate modifications to the great social and cultural challenges we were wrestling with, where familiar landmarks and benchmarks seemed to be disappearing. The first full article I ever published back in 1979, for example, was a comparison between Elie Wiesel's night about his horrific experiences as a teenager in Auschwitz and Buchenwald, and the dark night of John of the Cross. And since then, I've revisited John's Noche Oscura numerous times in various talks and writings. So this inaugural lecture in troubled times gives me a providential opportunity to take stock once again, to recall the origins of this terminology and understanding of the dark night in John of the Cross, and to look at how these have come to be applied and perhaps sometimes misapplied today, paying special attention to the ways in which John's 16th century insights can be applied to our 20th, 21st century uh, struggles. So let me say a few words about the origin of John's text. The prose work that we know today as the Dark Knight of the Soul, like the Ascent of Mount Carmel, takes as its starting point one of John's finest poems, which begins with the line, En una noche oscura, and we heard a few verses at the beginning of this talk. The eight stanzas are sung by a lover escaping in darkness from a quieted house to meet her beloved. Both the poem and the corresponding prose work seem to be clearly linked somehow to the most famous incident in John's life, namely his kidnapping and nearly nine month incarceration in the Carmelite monastery prison of Toledo. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't want to bad mouth the uh, Carmelite. <laughs> Through a complex series of events, John had become the victim of jurisdictional disputes between those who supported and those who opposed certain developments in St. Teresa's reform, which he had joined years before as a young Carmelite priest. Unfortunately, Unlike his collaborator and mentor, Teresa of Avila, John left no spiritual autobiography. And so we have no firsthand testimony about what he endured during his imprisonment. Though the witnesses interviewed in the process leading to his canonization spoke of it, sometimes in lurid detail. Suffice it to say that the conditions were harsh, that for his alleged disobedience, he was confined to a cramped cell, really a closet, with little light, no change of clothes, little food, sometimes beaten, etc., while his friar captors tried to persuade him that the reform had failed and that he should renounce it. We are told that his sense of abandonment by friends was accompanied by an even, even greater interior darkness, feelings of abandonment by God and temptations to despair. Perhaps to pass the time, he began composing verses in his head, and later a friendlier friar jailer supplied him with materials to write them down. So John took these with him when he made a daring nighttime escape in mid-August of 1578, and subsequently 
he began sharing them with the friars and nuns of Teresa's reform, and their requests for further explanation of the poems led gradually to the composition of his major prose works. Despite what's sometimes assumed, there's ample internal and external evidence that the poem En Una Noche Oscura was not among those he composed while still in prison, but was written following his escape after he went out unseen, Sali sin ser notada, to quote one of the lines. Both the poem and the Noche Oscura commentary look back on events that have already taken place. As John writes in his commentary prologue, before embarking, quote, before embarking on an explanation of these stanzas, we should remember that the soul recites them when it has already reached the state of perfection, that is, union with God through love, and has now passed through severe trials and conflicts along the constricted way to eternal life, end quote. Indeed, um, those still undergoing these severe trials and conflicts are unlikely to sing of a glad night, a noche dichosa, as the verses do, and may not even be able to recognize their condition as a genuine dark night while they're still in it. In any case, En Una Noche Oscura is generally hailed by modern critics as a masterpiece of Spanish literature, even when read simply as exquisite love poetry. It's frequently set to music and has inspired numerous works of art. You see that John Michael Talbot or Lorena McKennett and so on and many others have, have put it to music. Theologians and spiritual writers today often note that John's poetry deserves greater attention in its own right as the original expression of his mysticism. But here, due to lack of time, we must pass on quickly to the formidable prose works linked to this poem. The treatises we know as The Ascent of Mount Carmel and The Dark Night of the Soul are both introduced with this same poem in Una Noche Oscura. The stanzas of which John claims, quote, include all the doctrine I intend to discuss, end quote. But in the ascent, John quickly digresses into a multitude of classifications and subdivisions before ending abruptly in mid-sentence after hundreds of pages. The Dark Knight Treatise, by contrast, cues closer to the verses, but starts over again from the initial stanza at the beginning of both book one and book two, and never gets beyond the first line of the third stanza. There are no surviving autographs. Scholars speculate as to why both treatises come down to us in an unfinished form, and whether later censors under the watchful eye of the Spanish Inquisition might have removed final chapters that seemed too daring in their description of mystical states. But it seems more likely that John himself dropped these projects when he realized he could provide a more comprehensive and attractive panorama of the whole spiritual itinerary through a commentary on his spiritual canticle poem. Whatever the case, the Dark Knight Treatise seems in some way to satisfy discussing in the first three sections what John calls the active night of sense and spirit. There would be a fourth section to, quote, discuss the night insofar as it is passive. Indeed, in the second redaction of the Living Flame of Love commentary, John makes a reference to, quote, the dark night of the ascent of Mount Carmel, end quote, which has led many commentators to consider these two treatises, the, the ascent and the dark night, as a kind of a diptych, despite some stylistic differences. What's beyond doubt, however, is that references to dark night pervade both of these works far more than in John's other writings. And that leads us to the first crucial question, what exactly is this dark night that John speaks of and to what does it refer? Uh, many who invoke this expression seem to assume that it has a single unambiguous meaning in John's writings. But in fact, for John of the Cross, dark night is not a univocal term, but it's a master symbol. In the Ascent and the Dark Night treatises, he speaks, for example, of the dark night of senses, the night of the spirit, and even the night of the intellect, the night of the memory, and the dark night of the will. But elsewhere, he also identifies the dark night with contemplation, with mortification of the appetites, with purification of the soul, with faith, and with the narrow gate and constricted road leading to eternal life. 
For John, even God, and perhaps especially God, is said to be, quote, a dark night to the soul in this life, end of quote. Perhaps more surprising, the precise phrase, dark night of the soul, noche oscura del alma, appears nowhere in John's extant writings, but was assigned later as a title to the treatise we know by this name, along with its chapter divisions and headings when it was published in 1618 in the first edition of John's works, 17 years after his death. But what connects these various usages is a particular understanding of the possibilities and limitations of our human nature, an understanding that doesn't originate with John, but which she pushes toward fairly radical conclusions. Without going into the complex details of John's scholastic psychology and theology, we can say that he shares with Aristotle, Aquinas, and many others the view that all our natural knowing originates in sensory experience, as do the natural operations of our will and memory, which depend upon the intellect. This means, of course, that we can have no direct natural knowledge of God because God is pure spirit, imperceptible to the external senses. At best, we're naturally capable of only an indirect knowledge of God and thus an indirect love of God by means of the world around us. <coughs> Sorry. Similarly, contemporary psychologists explore how our images of God are typically grounded in perceptions of the parental figures of our childhood. But what we learn of God through creatures falls infinitely short of knowing and loving God as God is. Fortunately, we also have the capacity, what the scholastics call an obediential potency, to receive God's direct self-communication in what John calls the secret and peaceful and loving inflow of contemplation. All we need do, says John, is to let go of our natural operations when God invites us to do so and open ourselves to this divine initiative, which is always being offered. And if everything were functioning properly, that would be easy enough. But there lies the difficulty. From the outset our spiritual, of our spiritual journey, we find ourselves with a fallen human nature, torn by disordered desires, clinging to our limited ideas, feelings, and memories that prevent us from receiving the unbounded knowledge and love God wants to communicate. And though we may strive to remove the blockages ourselves, our own best efforts are tainted by the same disordered desires, and so in some ways become further symptoms of the problem. Hence the need, according to John, for a radical purification, which we neither initiate nor control, but we can only cooperate with or resist. So turning to the treatise itself of the Dark Knight. Uh, this is precisely the subject matter of the Dark Knight treatise, which deals with the purification insofar as it is passive. Given John rec John's recognition that we are spirits in the world, that is that our human nature includes both sensory and spiritual dimensions, the treatise comprises two main parts. The 14 chapters of book one deal with what is called the passive night of the senses, and the 25 chapters of book two focus on what's called the passive night of the spirit. John acknowledges, of course, that the purification of sense and spirit are fundamentally interrelated and ongoing, but partly for expository purposes, he situates these passive nights as transitional phases between the classic three ways or three ages of the spiritual life. That is, the introductory purgative way of beginners, the intermediate illuminative way of proficients, and the culminating unitive way of the perfect. Again, John didn't invent that, that uh, threefold uh, pattern. Uh, it goes way, way back in, to uh, the early church. Um, Thus, in book one of the Dark Knight Treatise, John presents the passive night of the senses as occurring, especially when spiritual beginners are ready to move on to the next stage. Their first fervor, initially a crucial motivation for conversion of life, starts to wane. The senses, sensory satisfaction they previously experienced in their religious practices and prayer dries up and they feel lost and confused. To show why this needs to happen, John offers a masterful review of the typical imperfections of beginners, 
based on the categories of the seven capital sins. Thus, while appearing devout, these beginners, often unconsciously, typically fall into spiritual pride, envy, sloth, gluttony, and all the rest, impatient with themselves and others, always wanting to give advice rather than receive it, restlessly shifting from one spiritual practice or devotional object to another, thinking that what gives them the most satisfaction must be the most pleasing to God. They likewise assume that any pastor, confessor, formator, or fellow Christian who doesn't admire and approve their fervor must somehow be less holy. Their prayer tends to be very busy, filled with many words and much pious reflection, leading to all sorts of good resolutions, which unfortunately are too seldom implemented. In a word, we could describe this as an infatuation stage full of energy and enthusiasm and important in drawing us away from other loves, but also full of illusions about God, ourselves, and others. But as we know, infatuations never last. Disillusionment sets in, and the excitement gradually fades for beginners as one's familiar ways of praying and one's former religious activities become dry and unsatisfying. This passive night of sense forces us to confront the question, was my intense religiosity really motivated by love of God, or as I thought, or by the satisfaction I used to feel? Answering honestly leads to greater personal humility about our own weak spiritual condition, greater reliance on God, and less judgmentalism toward others. Those who can learn to let go and wait on God will find that they're moving into what John calls the illuminative way of proficience and what others have called easefulness. They're no longer tossed about by their religious consolations and enthusiasms, but their spiritual lives and religious commitments are more stable as they steadily grow in reliable virtue. Their preferred way of praying becomes more contemplative, more receptive, quote, not thinking much, but loving much, to use St. Teresa's words, opening more and more to God's transforming self-communication. They may even tap into further levels of consciousness and develop certain spiritual gifts as they continue to grow. But according to John, uh, although the previous excesses of the initial stage have been moderated, the deeper roots underlying the imperfections of beginners remain. And so a further, more radical purification is required before one can fully enter into the unitive way. This is the passive night of spirit that John discusses in the second book of the night and what many people identify as the dark night of the soul. Here it's no longer primarily a matter of experiencing frustration in our former devotions and religious activities, but a crisis that shakes us to the very core of our being, as our spiritual lives and even our sense of self seem to fall apart completely. We feel abandoned by God, forsaken by friends, unworthy, lost, empty, hopeless, in total interior darkness, and all the rest. John says these are the ones who go down into hell alive. For John, God's self-communication is actually becoming more intense at this time, but because we're not ready and still so imperfect, the experience is painful and dark, like walking out from a dark room into bright sunlight. We're blinded. John uses the image of a fire and kindling a log. The fire drives all of the impurities to the surface, and so it seems like the log is getting uglier, but in fact, the impurities were always hidden within, and they're now being exposed so that they can be burned away. For John, this is how the Holy Spirit works in the passive night of the Spirit, searching all the dark corners of our hearts where all our secret and subconscious resistance to God lies hidden. But the suffering involved is only for the sake of healing. Through this process, all our capacities and desires are purified, set in order, integrated, and oriented toward God, so that God's loving self-communication is no longer impeded. Once the work is done, we are filled with light, divine light. We become firmly established in virtue. We reach a state of inner joy, harmony, and peace with God, neighbor, and self. In John's terms, we enter into the perfect state of spiritual marriage in the unitive way. We're simultaneously divinized and humanized, becoming by participation 
what Christ was by nature, as John puts it. Divine wisdom, says John in the Dark Knight's penultimate chapter, is united with the soul in a new bond of the possession of love. And then a few sentences later, the text abruptly stops. This, at any rate, is a vastly oversimplified sketch of the major themes in the Dark Knight of the Soul treatise, presented in far greater detail by other commentators and perhaps already familiar to you. In the past, this text was often read as a precise roadmap of the individual soul's spiritual progress through clearly differentiated stages and a useful handbook for spiritual directors who had the misfortune to have to guide rare individuals called a mystical union. Uh, but John himself acknowledges that, quote, God leads each one along different paths so that hardly one spirit will be found like another in even half its method of procedure, end of quote. Thus, he offers no encouragement to those who would use the dark night of the soul text as a measuring rod for gauging an individual's spiritual attainment. Though he famously presents three practical signs or indications by which one can judge whether it is an opportune time for beginners to discontinue meditation, he, does, he gives those signs several times, he would be skeptical, I suspect, of those today who list precisely five or seven or even 18 signs for determining whether you're experiencing a true dark night of the soul, whatever that would mean, and with 11 strategies for moving through it. Um, in fact, a, a, I think a crucial part of the passive night of spirit, as John understands it, is learning to let go of our own strategies and allowing the process to take us somewhere that we do not anticipate or understand. It's worth noting that in his surviving letters of spiritual direction, John never specifically diagnoses anyone as being in this or that particular phase of the dark night. Rather, in the midst of their difficulties, he simply encourages those he's guiding to, quote, live only in dark and true faith and certain hope and complete charity, living here below like pilgrims, the poor, the exiled, orphans, the thirsty, without a road and without anything, hoping for everything. That's in letter 19. In any case, to limit the scope of the dark night to a phase of growth in our prayer life, narrowly understood would be an impoverishment of John's master symbol. As Jane Ackerman has observed, quote, the poor of this world rarely report that their dark nights are brought on by God in prayer, end of quote. Fortunately, John's teaching on the passive nights in the dark night of the soul treatise is now being interpreted in a much more inclusive way. In recent decades, sometimes conjoining the different passive nights that John identifies into a single dark night of the soul, various authors are creatively exploring the ways in which his message speaks more broadly to our human experience of devastating suffering, loss of meaning and purpose, seeming hopelessness, and profound confusion with no way forward. Jürgen Moltmann, for example, has argued that, quote, the place of mystical experience today and the context of the journey into the dark night is not the monastery cell, but the prison cell for those who are persecuted because of their witness to the truth. Gustavo Gutierrez, one of the founders of liberation theology, has written that, quote, John of the cross, John of the nights, of solitude, of the road, of the encounter with God, is not foreign to the poor of Latin America in their struggle for social justice. In her frequently quoted article, Impasse and Dark Night, Constance Fitzgerald has, quote, looked at John of the Cross's teaching on the dark night through the lens of impasse and applied it not only to personal spiritual growth as well as to one's relational life, but also to the development of society and culture and the feminist experience of God. So influential has been uh, Fitzgerald's rereading of John of the Cross's Dark Knight that it set the theme for the 2009 annual convention of the Catholic Theological Society of America. In short, as we saw in the article cited in the first part of this talk, many people today invoke the Dark Knight as an important interpretive key in addressing our pain, disorientation, and helplessness before overwhelming personal and societal challenges. <laughs>
And this is confirmed, I think, very nicely by Pope John Paul II. In a letter he wrote for the fourth centenary of John's death, and I'll just read a few parts of this. He says, the mystical doctor appeals today to many believers and non-believers because he describes the dark night as an experience which is typically human and Christian. Our age has known times of anguish which have made us understand this expression better and which have furthermore given it a kind of collective character. The term dark night is now used of all of life and not just a phase of the spiritual journey. The saint's doctrine is now invoked in response to this unfathomable mystery of human suffering, physical, moral, and spiritual suffering, like sickness, like the plagues of hunger, like war, injustice, solitude, the lack of meaning in life, the very fragility of human existence, the sorrowful knowledge of sin, the seeming absence of God, are for the believer all purifying experiences which might be called night of faith. To this experience, St. John of the Cross has given the symbolic and evocative name, Dark Night. In other words, although his own 1948 doctoral dissertation on faith in John of the Cross was written in a more neo-scholastic style under the supervision of Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange, the late Pope himself here seems to acknowledge and even encourage a broader understanding of the dark night of the soul, like those we saw earlier with those commentators characterizing the pandemic, economic crisis, systemic racism, and a host of societal ills in these terms. In short, and perhaps paradoxically, John's 16th century dark night symbol and text has much light to offer regarding the personal, communal, and global challenges of our 21st century context. But this also raises some further reflections and questions which I would like to mention briefly before uh, concluding my remarks. First, I think it's, it's important to recall that for John of the Cross, although he's best known for the dark night, darkness and suffering are not the whole story. And the agonizing passive nights discussed in the dark night treatise are not meant to be permanent conditions, but rather steps along the way towards an enduring transformation in love and mystical union with God. The painful and dark purification turns to light and joy when the obstacles to God's self-communication are removed. Granted, God always remains in some sense dark and obscure to us in this life, but for those who've reached the unitive way, it's a glad night. David Bentley Hart has rightly stressed that the goal of the dark nights, according to John of the Cross, is not suffering for its own sake, but quote, progress of the soul toward divinization in Christ and participation in the inner life of the Trinity. John's teaching on theosis or divinization, though less well known, is just as robust as what one finds in Eastern Christian theology. And this leads secondly to an another question. When our contemporaries today describe certain experiences and situations as a personal or collective dark night of the soul, what sort of outcome do they foresee or hope for? Constance Fitzgerald speaks eloquently of a quote, an irrevocable, irrevocable passage into a new place, a new way of being in the universe, standing open to receive the unimaginable future to which God is alluring us. Often, however, those who describe our current social context as a dark night seem to long only for a return to normal. Of course, Carmelites have no copyright on the phrase dark night of the soul, and people are free to use it as they wish. But I would suggest that a simple return to the way things were before we reached the impasse would not count as a dark night in, in the San Juanist sense. The dark nights which interest John are transformative, and they result in outcomes that we cannot predict or control, but only receive. If nothing changes, is it a truly a dark night of the soul in John's sense? If we learn nothing from the experience or we learn the wrong things, is it still a dark night? This suggests an answer to the third question, what counts as an authentic dark night? Much ink has been spilled, for example, over the possible connection between John's dark night and clinical depression. Some say, well, you're really using different languages there. Clinical depression is a psychological term, dark night is a theological term, and so on. 
But as theologian Dennis Turner has observed, both challenge our familiar sense of self, and the two may at times coexist, as when a severe bout of clinical depression triggers a spiritual crisis. But they're not identical, since those undergoing great interior darkness can still remain highly functional in a way that the clinically depressed typically cannot, as we see, for example, in the case of Mother Teresa, who during her most active and, and uh, productive years was going through a tremendous inner darkness. And this suggests, therefore, that not every painful adversity automatically qualifies as a dark night of the soul in John's sense. People nowadays will sometimes casually say things like, well, last week I was experiencing a dark night of the soul, but this week I'm better, you know. Uh, and uh, we even have a friar in, in our house who used to joke every, that every time his football team lost, he would go through a dark night of the soul. Uh, but in John's sense, of course, uh, a true passive night of the spirit will be profound and may in fact last for many years, he says. A fourth point, while John gives a general description of what typically occurs during the passive nights, he recognizes that the particulars will vary. Not everyone undergoing, undergoes this in the, he says, not everyone undergoes this in the same way Neither are the temptations identical. All is meted out according to God's will and the greater or lesser amount of imperfection that must be purged from each one, end quote. I saw this, I've seen this confirmed, for example, in her classic study, Mysticism, Evelyn Underhill illustrates the claim that, quote, the dark night is not a series of specific moods and events, but a phase of growth largely conditioned by individual temperament. And she shows this by pointing out the interesting case of uh, blessed Henry Suzo, who was a 14th century Dominican mystic. He was much admired when he stayed inside and practiced uh, heroic asceticism, and he was thought to be a very holy man, uh, until one day he experienced a vision telling him that it was time to graduate from that lower school to the higher school. And uh, immediately after that, he was kind of thrust out into secular activities that he had to take care of, and a woman appeared who accused him of uh, fathering her child. And he was basically uh, uh, no good at practical activities. Um, and so there was a case where what, what happened to him was in very active context, but he, he was being detached from his, from his own reputation. Underhill says, it's interesting to observe how completely human and apparently unmystical was the culminating trial by which Suzo was perfected. It was by the path of humanity, by some of the darkest and most bitter trials of human experience, the hardest tests of its patience and love, that Suzo came into the sustained peace of heart and union with the divine will that marked his last state. The whole tendency of these trials in the path of humanity seems to be directed towards the awakening of those elements left dormant by the rather specialized disciplines and purifications of cloistered life. Uh, in other words, the dark nights may vary greatly according to the time and place and particular type of purification needed. Thus, the external triggers, the, the externals that trigger or accompany these dark nights may seem far from anything spiritual in the narrow sense. Divorce, public shaming, life-threatening illness, wrongful imprisonment as John experienced and so on. A fifth point, uh, we still need to exercise caution, I think, before too glibly describing great tragedies, injustices, and catastrophes as dark nights of the soul, at least in John's sense, because most typically John explains the pain of the passive nights as resulting mainly from uh, our resistance to God's more intense self-communication. And this may well describe the Christian struggling to grow in prayer, but it would be problematic to characterize the Nazi Holocaust or COVID-19 pandemic or systemic racism in the same way. Uh, invoking John's dark night imagery and theology here should not suggest that a loving God would deliberately cause such things for our purification, but only that God can help us to grow through these horrors, horrors drawing good out of evil. A further point in the sixth place is that we need to clarify important differences, I think, between personal and societal dark nights. While individuals may move and have moved 
through the radical passive night of spirit into the unitive way, John himself is an example, human societies do not, at least not this side of the coming of the kingdom of God in its fullness. What we can hope for in a societal dark night is a letting go of old ways that have led to impasse and a movement toward a new order marked by peace, justice, and love beyond our ability to create or imagine by ourselves. But each successive generation is composed of new individuals who have to repeat the journey from fallenness to divinization all over again. Finally, though we've uh, focused in this lecture on the experiential aspects, it's important to remember that the dark night in John of the Cross is a theological category, even more than a psychological one. Understandably, in the midst of so many contemporary crises, people want to know how to cope with their feelings of desolation, confusion, abandonment, and impasse. But whether we're experiencing joy or suffering, the natural boundaries on our knowledge and language of God remain. We're finite creatures with a longing for the infinite. And for us as Christians, the only path forward is through dying and rising with Christ. With the apophatic turn in contemporary theology, scholars are discovering John's doctrine of the dark night has helpful applications, not only in spirituality and spiritual direction, but also in Trinitarian theology, theological epistemology, Christology, soteriology, sacramentology, eschatology, and a host of other areas of theological study. So, I must end here having barely scratched the surface of all that could be said, knowing that there's always infinitely more that can never be adequately expressed. But I hope that I've persuaded you, although probably you were already persuaded, of the enduring value of John's classic Dark Knight symbol and text. My personal goal is to explore them ever more deeply in the years ahead before I'm overtaken by the da Dark Knight of, of geriatric cognitive impairment. Uh, but finally then, as we continue our journey during this difficult time, may we never forget that the light that came into the world two millennia ago still comes to us today in the midst of every dark night. So thank you all very much for listening and I wish you all a Merry Christmas. I think you'll all agree with me that was a very profound uh, lecture and talk on the dark night of the soul. Very intense as well, as of course the dark night experience can be. However, the good news is you will be able to watch this lecture time and time again and keep absorbing that profound teaching that we received just now from Father Stephen. So thank you very much, Father Stephen. Uh, we don't have time for questions, unfortunately, as there probably would be many. We have well over 300 people uh, participating in the event. So the good news is, as I mentioned, the, the, this lecture has been recorded. You may be also wondering a little bit more about the um, Endowed Chair for Carmelite Studies and the Center for Carmelite Studies. Sponsored by the province of the Most Pure Heart of Mary and established within the School of Theology here at Catholic University, the Endowed Chair and Center for Carmelite Studies promotes academic studies and research related to this rich Carmelite tradition as well as pastoral applications of the results through courses, programs, lectures, support for doctoral projects on Carmelite topics. You may know of someone who would be interested in this, or you yourself may find yourself after today being more and more interested in doing further studies, or going deeper into the Carmelite tradition. We invite you to go to our page, 
on the School of Theology and Religious Studies website by simply going to the Catholic University's uh, website, going to the search engine and typing in Carmelite Studies. That will take you straight to our Carmelite Studies page. And I think you'll find there very uh, helpful information if you wish to explore further uh, studies in the Carmelite tradition. I think that would be um, a very good place to start. Thank you once again for participating in this inaugural lecture. I think you'll agree with me that Father Stephen put an enormous amount of effort into preparing this lecture for us. I know throughout this past week or more, he has constantly touched base with me and said how much work he has been doing, how much energy he is putting into it. And I think that was very obvious today for, as, as we experienced that. Let us perhaps conclude our time together now with prayer. And it's a prayer that comes from today's collect on the feast day, from the collect of the Mass. O oh God, who gave the priest St. John of the Cross an outstanding dedication to perfect self-denial and love of the Cross, grant that by imitating him closely at all times, we may come to contemplate eternally your glory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, pray for us. Saint John of the Cross, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Advent blessings of peace and joy to you and your loved ones, your members of your community, and a very happy, holy, and safe Christmas to everyone. God bless you.